There you are. Hello there. <laughs> Paul, so I'm going to do a little introduction introduction to you, Paul. So okay. af after a series of spontaneous experiences as a teenager, he left his sleepy village near the west, uh, coast of West Wales and spent the next five years in a video. And the wonderment of what is. And sharing to represent representatives of most of the world's religions. Since then, Paul has quietly drank tea traveled and chatted with people from all over the world about which simply is. Uh, <laughs> Council. He is a pillar of integrity and authenticity for all those seeking the freedom of what is. Um, Paul, if you can get, just do a little introduction, that'll be much appreciated. <laughs> Hello. Well, we're going to have a paradoxical introduction. Um, a slightly uh, drunken introduction because we're using um, something called language, which isn't designed for the simplicity of this. It's designed for a particular purpose. It's designed for movement. So it's the one thing that language can't, can't measure, can't talk about. So this is just going to be a, para a conceptually a paradoxical conversation about the intrinsic isness, which appears to be words, appears to be silence, appears to be no thing, appears to be everything, appears to be a speaker, appears to be a listener. And it sings about that the possibility is that that appearance isn't quite what it appears to be, that it isn't the appearance of a something that there was ne never a something ever born. There was never a something ever to be a subject or an object, a speaker or a listener. There was never a something to be a cup of tea or a seeker or a finder. There was never a something to be duality or non-duality. All these are slightly drunken words because they're completely drunk on the alcohol of time and space really. They're designed, as you said, to as an enhancement of movement. It's, it's designed to, in a way, language, knowledge, perception appears in that apparent gap between two things. It's a comparison tool, really. Um, but again, paradoxically, the simplicity of this has no other so there is nothing to compare it to. So it's the one thing that language can't approach. Language is beautiful for other things, but for this one crazy sort of conversation, it's of no use. <laughs> so it's a paradoxical introduction that can't approach what is. But we can talk. And there can be questions and there can be responses. But nothing will ever be explained or described in the sense of there being a something. It is the words and it is the silence. So it's a very short conversation which results in just drinking a cup of tea so we can have a virtual cup of tea and a chat so are there any specific questions you have emerson yes yes um you wrote nothing to measure here nothing to grasp here nothing to hold on to here <laughs> it's 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 even simpler than that there is no no thing that can be a holder or a grasper or a getter that's what this crazy 
crazy song sings about, that this freedom is already the case. It's unconditional because it already is the case. It's only in knowledge, in that illusion of knowledge, do those concepts, those measurements occur of a getting, a finding, or a losing. Because again, it was, that's what it's built for. It's built to the five senses and then the brain and then language later, all what I call an edge protocol. They're all designed to compare, to make comparisons between two apparent things. It predicts in that comparison that there must be a, a separate thing called a cup of tea and there must be a separate thing called a drinker of a cup of tea. Whereas that cup of tea or the separate something which is a cup of tea has never been known. No thing has ever been known. Only comparisons. Only when there's the appearance of two things and that apparent gap, then knowledge can occur. Then the game of knowledge can arise. And that knowledge is always temporal. It's always subject to comparisons. And it's always ever-changing. Whereas the intrinsic isness of a cup of tea, of language, of silence, of nothing, of everything, has no comparison, has no measurement. So it cannot be approached. There is no thing that can get closer to everything. So again, conceptually, this is a complete drunken, playful conversation that just sings the same song, really. Back. <laughs> Sorry, did I, did I disappear? <laughs> Apparently. That's okay. That's okay. You're back. And I'm back, okay. too. Wait, 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 when did I disappear? <laughs> <laughs> um, this song sings maybe about just about the five seconds ago. Okay. The songs. The songs, the songs that sings yeah. drunkenly about the possibility that there is no something which is a speaker and no separate something which is, a, which is a listener. There's no separate something which is a mover, a seer, a hearer. So it just sings crazily. What happens if there's life and no separate something which has a life? What happens if there's drinking a cup of tea and no separate something that is drinking a cup of tea? What happens if that cup of tea is just an edgeless edge? But everything sings its, its edgelessness yet appears to be an edge, a something in comparison to another thing. And just the physiology through that mechanism, it's a utility mechanism. The physio, the five senses, and then the brain, and then language. It's just a utility protocol, an edge protocol, all designed, in a sense, to replicate. To, con to maintain itself. And it's done a, a brilliant job because it has to... Uh, hmm. this, this freedom is so immeasurable. It has to... It, it has no um, use for it, in a sense. But what it was interested in is replicating itself. So it, the five senses, the brain and language are a very simplified mechanism 
to delete anything that it felt didn't have utility into a, into a, a usable, actionable model. And in that process, it, it is like a compression. It's like an energetic compression, which allowed the physiology to predict that there must be a center to an, to an apple, to a me, to a you. And yet that has never been known. It's just a utility, it's just a, a useful prediction which helps the organism create model, actionable models. Because again, it's overriding impulse is to move. And within that, you could say its first commandment was don't die. <laughs> In your movement, don't die. So it's developed this utility protocol, this edge protocol, a very simplified edge protocol, a reproducible edge protocol, both physiologically and then later culturally, in which all our beliefs and all our truths come from, which was just fit, which was just subjective to begin with, then became cultural, shareable. But it's the same pattern repeating itself in a, in a more sophisticated way. But in it, right back from before thought, was that prediction, that compression that there must be a centre, the sense of a centre. And that's the, that's the original origination of fake news. Now, the... the you could say in the, in the context of this sort of conversation, evolution is the originator of fake news. And to maintain that, it's the originator of consumerism. Because it wants the organism to keep replicating, to keep moving. So it needs to keep the organism in a sort of imbalance, in a sort of discontent. Because that has that has is advantageous to its to maintaining that movement, that appearance. So we could have a conversation about how the body produces the appearance of a something, and maintains it very cleverly. And quite ruthlessly. But it's all built and held on that root, on that original compression prediction held by fake news that there is a center. There is a separate center to an apple, to a tree. And yet a separate center, whether you call it objective or subject, has never been known. Only in that apparent gap between two things does knowledge appear. It's always a comparison. It's never the thing in itself. It's always a comparison. So this is why this is totally unsuited to the, of this. This is why it cannot be languaged. It cannot be written in a book. It cannot be communicated. So this, again, is a very paradoxical and quite gloriously drunk conversation. Thank about you. About what already is the case. <laughs> There's a lot of drunkenness happening. <laughs> In many, many ways. <laughs> yeah. Even the fake news is very drunk. And, and again, paradoxically, that fake news had, in a sense, is inherently violent. 
using that word in quite a neutral way now. It's, it's quite violent to, it, to itself and to what it perceives to be others. But it's a bit more problematic now in that the tools that we have are a little bit more potent than bats and spears. But that movement built on fake news to replicate, in a sense, is inherently self-terminating, one way or another. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I have a, I have a, uh, <laughs> I, uh, um, I have a bunch of questions here. <laughs> Is there a physical world or just an appearance of one? An anonymous question. It's like that lovely, I think it's an Indian story about if, if I say, Emerson, I, I want to give you something. I have this lump of gold and I want to make you this most beautiful necklace out of gold. So, so I work and I create that necklace. Be careful of these words now. This is just poetry in a way. So I make this gold necklace and I hand this necklace to you and say, Emerson, are there two things? Are th is there gold and is there a necklace? Are there two things? But can the necklace be said to be or not to be? Again, the question comes out, it's a very drunken question out of the alcohol of time and space. And again, paradoxically, there is no answer. There's a response, but there is no answer. Because again, language is a very simplified, you could say binary utility designed to enhance movement. Whereas again, the intrinsic isness of movement of, of a cup of tea is immeasurable, is timeless, spaceless. And so it's like you can push the brain language towards it in a way, and then it just melts as that's why it's quite a drunken conversation. So there is no answer to that question because it cannot be said to be and it cannot be said not to be. It's just the possibility that a cup of tea is not a separate something. It's not quite what it appears to be. That literally that cup of tea is immeasurable. That sound, the question, is singing its own answer. Everything is singing this. In a sense, everything is singing its own absence. In the sense of not being a separate something that was ever born. Because if the gold and the necklace are two things, I could give you the necklace and keep the gold. Thank you. Um, and so much movement. Why is there apparently movement? What is this movement? Hmm. This movement appears in that apparent gap between two things. But the what happens if there's movement, Amazon, but no something that moves?
What happens to that apparent movement? Again, it's similar to the previous question of is there a something, is there a world? Is there a gold, a separate gold necklace? Was there a necklace ever born? A separate something, a necklace ever born? What happens if stillness moves? <laughs> language can't go there. And yet language, sound, is what is. Everything is an edgeless edge, including movement, including a cup of tea. That appear in that a gap, in that apparent gap between two things. All based on fake news. Which in a sense is just a compression But like the, I've always called this freedom of the ocean. It's almost like, it's like the, the dance of the ocean, there's compressions and those compressions appear as forms, as movement. But again, be careful of these words. You can put all these words in a bin. There's no gap between the no thing <laughs> There's and everything. There's a question here. Uh, Sorry, I, 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 Isa, I, 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 is life self-conscious design purpose or reasonlessly happening? Sorry, Emerson, can you repeat? You are breaking up. Sure. Is life self-conscious designing with purpose or just recentlessly happening was there ever a gold necklace was there ever something born that could have a life but in the story of life freedom can appear to be anything it can appear to have a reason or not a reason. Because it, there's no gap between no thing and everything. There's no gap between subject and object. There's no gap between past and future. There's no gap between birth and death. There's no gap between male and female, old and young, us and them. Creation, destruction. The intrinsic isness of whatever's appearing has, is gapless in that sense. There's no distance in time or space for there to be an other. But in this freedom, anything can appear as it were. but it's not quite what it appears to be. <laughs> Jenny wrote, lovely to see you, Paul. Could you explain a bit more what you said about how the body makes you believe it has a center? So originally, in the context of that question, the, the organism had to move. 
It had to be food or find food. So its priority was to, because its priority is to replicate, its priority was to, in a sense, decipher between using this edge protocol, a this and a that. Is it food or am I food? So it, it had to simplify that the, 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 you could say the infinity of data that was being presented, the immeasurableness, it had to simplify, it had to simplify into actionable, into usable data, information. So the edges which it found had most utility, it, you could say it's, it's through compression, it solidified those into, into things. And it held those things. It just became a lot more effective in doing that, to, in that compression, to, to predict that these things must be separate things, including in the context of this conversation, um, the, say the subject and the object. The subject must have a, a center and the object has another center. And yet it has never known a center. In that sense, it has never known a something. But it predicts that there must be a, a something in these comparisons between a this and a that. So the things the patterns or the edges that had most utility, it solidified those, you could say, into its model, into its st stimulus response model, into is it food or am I food? Because it had to move. It had no interest in what is. <laughs> it didn't have the luxury. It had to know whether that, that was a lion is it looking at me or is it what I'm looking at? Is it possibly food? So in that edge protocol, it created the energetic compression and prediction of a center. And that, and when the brain later then was enabled in a way to stand back from that, in a sense, that two dimensional framework of stimulus response it created another object another edge in the way which we call the subject and it predicted that that must have a center but it was like rocket fuel within the body within the physiology within the organism because when the brain was able in a way to step back from that two-dimensional map it had the ability then to overlay other possibilities other models it wasn't simply a stimulus response model. It could overlay other possibilities. Do I run from the line or do I climb a tree? And that was like a superpower within the, what we call the human organism compared to most. It was like a specialism that the, 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 what we call the human physiology developed that the ability to specialize into a subject <laughs> and overlay other options onto, onto its map of the, of the world, you could say. And it's all held together by the, the prediction, the compression, the sense, the energetic sense that there must be a separate center to an apple, to a subject, to an object. And that's the fake news. And when the brain developed and then language developed, it was just an enhancement of that movement of towards or away in a simplistic way. So language is just an enhancement of movement and then it became shareable. So instead of the physiological evolution, we sort of like, we became more sophisticated into a, a cultural evolution, 
a shared evolution because again it had utility it had survival advantage it enhanced the ability of the of our inherent patterns to replicate when the models became shareable they became more powerful but again to be shareable to be languaged things have to be very simplified a bit like a, a modern day camera you can take a picture in raw with lots and lots of data but it takes a lot of processing whereas if you're went to find food or you might be food you can't spend too much time processing you have to act so it simplifies into like a jpeg model by de by deleting by deleting and the deletion again causes the compression within the physiology but it makes the models more actionable more reproducible and then those utility things which we found had most utility we developed because in, into hierarchies in a way because even though we need to know which pattern is most actionable because we can't act on them all you know which movement is going to be which edge we're always looking for an edge of what's the best movement going to be whether it's in business socially in health in fitness what's the edge you know what's the best way to move so in that hierarchy the things that have most utility we tended to give most em emotional meaning to reduce them we, we empower them and then those meanings were in put into a hierarchy and they tended to become, become our beliefs. The ones at the top became the beliefs, the cultural beliefs, the physiological beliefs. And then when those beliefs become shared enough, they become our truths, our cultural, our physiological truths. It's like a circle in a way. And then the truth is like the rubber hitting the the road again, the truths coming into impact with life. So the physiologies, again, always looking predominantly for new edges and it tends to recede uh, the edges it already knows uh, by, in a way, making them slightly boring as if, oh, I already know that. I know that's an apple, it's a bit boring now. I know that's a cup of tea. So, because it, it needs to take in, it's always looking to take in and has to, but it can often be full of heat and friction. It takes in new information to reformat its model, as it were, so it keeps going around. But it's the same pattern from the original the way the five senses developed to how the brain developed to how language developed to how our cultural norms developed it's the same pattern it's the same utility pattern all based on the premise on the energetic compression of information that enabled the body to predict that there is a center to an apple to a subject to an object and again that prediction has never ever been known knowledge is always of comparisons never of a something nothing has ever been known and likewise there is no center that has ever been a knower it's just an it energetically appears that way because that appearance has utility to replicate and in that movement of replication don't die. It's the command within the physiology. Move and don't die.
And if you can feel that, then it's looking, it's hypercharged to look for the edges, to look for the comparisons. This edge protocol is a comparison protocol. So there is no, there is no, no ignorance. There's just the illusion of knowledge. Which is great for, I think I often call it like a spade. Knowledge is like a spade. It's great for digging foundations into the, into the ground and building whatever structures you want. But with regard to the intrinsic isness of a cup of tea, it's absolutely useless. It's like taking that spade and trying to dig a hole into the ocean to build foundations there. It's just exhausting and doesn't go anywhere. It's an inappropriate tool. Language is an enhancement of movement. And in a way, it has no interest in, in, the, in the intrinsic isness of what is. It's a distraction at best. And it's also, at worst, it's very hostile. Language is there to enhance replication. It, it's not there to... to see its own absence. <laughs> to see its own death. Again, careful of my words. There's nothing that dies. <laughs> These are just drunken, drunken words. Thank there is you. no there is no gap between no thing and everything between subject and object between past and future no gap Thank you, that was very clear. Um, I know you already touched this a little bit on this one, but Isa um, asked, can you please elaborate a bit more on the word edge protocol? So if you can feel the, it's the, this knowledge is still within the, in the physiology, in, in the sense, the whole physiology is, is, is the outcome of, of its whole prior history, really. It's a regurgitation of all the patterns of its pre, you know, its tribal history, its physiological, physical history. So, if you can imagine, even before language, even before the brain became sophisticated enough to create the edge that there's a, a separate edge called a subject the five senses in themselves are like in a conversation so you have the environment let's call it the environment and the subject and the organism there's, it's a conversation between those two apparent edges And that conversation, like, like the raw file of a, a photograph, is infinitely complex and is unusable due to that. It's unprocessable. So the five senses in themselves started to simplify, started to delete any information that proved not to have utility. So it narrowed, narrowed, simplified, simplified vastly. I'm talking huge amounts of data were excluded just to the edges, the patterns that, that worked basically. If it worked, it was reproduced. 
If it didn't work, the organism died. So through that simplification process and deletion process, that's what I call the edge protocol. It's just looking for the edges that, had, that have utility for replication. So the edges, the patterns, the processes that had were found to be most, have most utility for replication, they were compressed, as it were, into things. Reproducible patterns, reproducible things. And the five senses did that before, again, the brain, before the sophisticated brain, by the sense that, that those edges were separate some things that can be measured and contrasted. So the edges, the processes, the patterns, and it does a magical job of that. It fills in so much blank information. The five senses fills in, there's so many blanks in the information. It's like the, the blind spot in the eye. It just fills it in with information. If there's a blank, it fills it in with information to make it usable and reproducible. Again, it's a bit like a, these modern sophisticated ca cameras that can stabilize everything because it becomes more usable. It stabilizes all these edges into, into orderly holes, as it were, that can be re reproducible through simplification and compression. And it mapped those by the, the energetic sense that each of those edges had a separate center. It just became more mappable, more reproducible, reproducible, more actionable. But it's that basic edge protocol that functions through the later development of the, the more sophisticated brain, the ability of the brain to create that edge called a subject, again with the prediction that it must have a center. Right through our, cult our cultural, our known history, it's the same edge protocol working. It's a utility protocol that's designed to function in the apparent gap between two things. So all knowledge appears in the gap between two or more apparent some things which have never been known. The necklace and the gold are not two. The cup of tea and the drinker are not two. The speaker and the listener are not two. The everything and the no thing are not two. It's a very short conversation. Thank you, Dallas. Really brilliant. I really like that. Um, there's a question here from Makiel. I cannot experience my own absence. It can only be, again, knowledge, or we call life, or we call experience, when there's the appearance of two things. So what happens if there's experience, but no something having an experience? Again, language, knowledge, that spade. This is 
this crazy drunken conversation is the one thing it can't know. It can't measure because it can't create a contrast between absence and presence. Because again, I apologize that this sounds paradoxical, but the possibility is that absence, there's no gap between those two measurements called absence and presence. No thing and everything. Then this won't go there. Knowledge won't go there. Experience won't go there. It's the one place it can't go, but please be careful of my words. They're drunken and they're all full of the alcohol of comparisons of time and space. Beautifully said, Paul. Um, there's a couple of messages here. Thank you, Paul, getting right through the Apple core. Sharp and insightful perspective. It resonates really well with my whatever something from Mala. <laughs> Mark goes, brilliant explanation. And here's a question. Seemingly, the protocols to sustain and replicate life are now working against the sustainability and replication of life on this apparent planet, would you say? Looking at the story of human organisms destroying other dis organisms. Can you comment on that? Well, basically, if you have a pattern that's prime objective is to replicate and generally speaking, speaking to the exclusion, exclusion of other patterns, that is inherently, again, using this word in a very neutral way, violent. So when you give that violence, in a sense, very powerful tools, it can become a lot more mischievous, much more um, destructive, also creative. So within the context of, you could say, human evolution, evolution itself has to turn around to itself and see the inherent fake news and violence at its core and say bugger off <laughs> again there's no thing that can do that but unless it begins to say to see that evolution the physiology is the birthplace of fake news and consumerism we're going to consume and consume until there's a depletion of what can be consumed. Because the, the movement is, you could say, inherently freedom. It will not be content, because it, again, it's designed, which we could go into another time, how it keeps that sense of being discontent. It's like walking, it always has to keep the the body in in uh, uh, imbalance to allow movement to happen if there's balance then the movement doesn't replicate which has which has no utility so it's got to keep the movement the consume the, the consuming the coming back for more it's got to keep it going. 
but there's always a problem with <laughs> with overconsumption, whether it's sweets, alcohol, the environment, ourselves, because it's as violent towards itself as it is towards others. That mechanism, because. You could say there's a jungle out there, but also there's a, a jungle in what we call in the subject, in which there's lots of patterns, lots of patterns wanting to replicate. And in a sense, in competition, the, the, the devil and the angel, as it were, they're in competition. So, from my perspective, this is just my character, unless evolution turns around on itself and sees the inherent fake news that basically is inherently, it inherent, it's, it's, it's designed to separate, it's designed to create contrast. Unless it's, it's seen that it's there for utility and not int intrinsically what is, then each measurement to say, I was born, I will die, I am male, I am female, I am white, I am black, there's us, there's them, are all inherently violent measurements. So if they become the beliefs, the truths, they become they can easily switch from having utility again because creation and destruction are not two. The things that were creative are then simultaneously destructive. Again, another paradox that you can't enhance creativity without enhancing destruction. You can't have more in-breaths without having more out-breaths. There's no gap, again, there's no gap between creation and destruction. Again, these are just utility measurements. What intrinsically is, is immeasurable. and is equally free being destructive as it is in being constructive. It's equally free in being in the so-called thing called knowledge and in the so-called thing called ignorance. But in the context of survival, the fake news, because of the, the tools at the disposal of humans is will become is becoming more problematic and will unless it's told to bugger off will become self terminating but was the necklace ever born Has anything ever been born? There's another question here. Thank you so much. That was brilliant as well. From Susan Hill. Why is there pain? Sometimes a lot of pain experiences in life. Why that movement? At its most basic, uh, basic, pain is designed into the system. I, uh, people use words differently. So you could say inherently designed into, around, held together by that fake news and the need to replicate, the need to consume. Inherently, the design of the organism is to maintain imbalance a level of imbalance, a level of dissatisfaction. 
a level of pain, a level of discontent. So it's, it's, it's quite ruthless in that sense. The pain is in the intrinsic woven fabric of, of the physiology. It's maintained by the physiology. So a little bit like previous, you know, why is there destruction? Why? But destruction is not separate from creation. It's, this, it's the same nerves that carry pleasure, that carry pain. Again, paradoxically, if you increase creation, you'll increase destruction. Paradoxically, if you increase pleasure, you'll increase the capacity for pain. It's the same nervous system. If you could enhance a hundredfold your pleasure ability, you'd enhance a hundredfold the ability to feel pain. It's part of the fabric of our DNA. And the, the ruthlessness of that evolutionary need to replicate is it's the most perfect like advertising company you could ever think of because it it, it purposely enhances the the hope of what's next what's next what's next And yet, if you notice within the physiology, as soon as the, phys the physiology gets close or experiencing that's what next, you, you watch it, it purposely removes the satisfaction and replaces it with a, a dissatisfaction. But not only does it do that, it also enhances the... the the forgetfulness of the unfulfilled hope of the dissatisfaction and enhances the hope again. It's like a loop. It's like a double whammy. It's like a right and a left. <laughs> and it, it always accentuates the hope, the, the, the possibility of what's next. This will be the answer. This will be, I'll be satisfied. And yet when that sense input arrives, it withdraws it, suppresses it, so it's not as memorable, and, and refocuses the attention on the hope again to keep the movement, to, to keep the organism coming back for more. So that evolution is the most, it's the perfect drug pusher. <laughs> and it wants the client to keep coming back for more. So it purposely maintains a level of discontent, of pain, of dissatisfaction. This is the game it plays. Held together on that root of fake news. So fake news is inherently married to consumerism. <laughs> more, more, more. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I wish we had that. That was just very lucid and I really enjoyed that. I wish we had like 24 hours of this. Um, a drunken conversations. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of questions that were not answered here. I, I apologize for that one. Um, we should, uh, someone's, uh, we should do kind of like an online retreat or something like that. Uh, that would be really awesome. Or if you have any retreat coming up or, or anything like that. Um, thank you for, 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 um, this amazing drunken conversation. Uh, it's like beautiful, beautiful. 
Well, th- th- thank you for having a cup of tea with me, even yes. if it's a virtual cup a of tea. A virtual one. We should have a cup of tea again soon. I enjoyed our interview too. That was, that was just really amazing too. Um, let's have a conversation again soon. Let's have a cup of tea soon. Um, yeah. and is, um, do you have any retreats coming up, Paul? And uh, uh, no, I don't. Um, I travel quite a bit. I just have cups of tea with folks, so people contact me. And obviously, COVID has been problematic for traveling and having cups of tea. So we'll see what happens. But it happens more now, I suppose, virtually. People just contact me yeah. via Skype and Zoom. Yeah, because people are from all over the world. And yeah, do you have I a contact a information? I, I never liked virtual stuff, but I'm, I'm appreciating my virtual cups of tea these days. <laughs> Likewise, I enjoy this. Okay. Um, I'll, uh, do you have any contact information that people can contact you, you know, for, for any one-on-one or anything like that? You know, onefreedomsong at, at gmail.com uh, or okay. via, you know, the Nothing Conference. I think, have you got the data all there? Yes, yes, we have that over there. And... Um, well, thank you so much. And, and is, uh, everything, is everything going okay for you? Is it, is yeah, it, yeah. Everything's technically great. Technically and everything? It kept on uh, logging off, but, um, but I think that can be fixed kind of like soon. Um, it should be okay. There are some, you know, it, it's, we're doing kind of like a two 12-hour live streams, right? So there are some glitches that are bound to happen, and that's oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're, re- we're, really, we're really surprised that yesterday went, you know, without a hitch. You know, everything kind of like happened, and or. But we have a great team and uh, we have support and all that kind of stuff. Oh, thank excellent. You, thank well, you, Paul. Well, and well. and I, I really appreciate this. This was a really amazing, um, brilliant conversation, although it's drunken. <laughs> <laughs> it, goes, it goes with the territory. <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everyone, we're going to be back with Lisa Lennon. Uh, So we're going to take a 15-minute break. I'm going to get another cup of tea. And please get a cup of tea. And uh, we'll see you back in 15 minutes. Uh, Thank you so much, Paul. And have a great day. And you. All the best for the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.